Alright, so a lot of you probably saw the title of this video and is wondering what it is about. So pretty much this game, everything leading up to this game's release has been incredibly interesting for us. And we really just want to talk about it due to, like not just because it's just, not just because it's interesting, but because of how it kind of reflects a lot of what we think of David Cage, Quantic Dream, and the games that they put out. Now, before we go into it, we should probably explain exactly how we feel about David Cage and Quantic Dream. I pretty much got involved where I'm, uh, I really wanted to play a narrative-driven game, and I really wanted to play Heavy Rain, but at the time, I did not own a PS3, so I bought Indigo Prophecy instead, because I heard they were made by the same people. And then I played it, I enjoyed it. You reviewed it? I reviewed it and said it was a good game. Although, as I grew up, I began, I, beca uh, I began to realize that most of these games are not really that good. I mean, they're very interesting for what they try to do, but execution-wise, most of these, like, all of the games fail tremendously. And, yeah, how about you, Brett? How did you get involved with this? <laughs> okay, so, like you, I first heard about it from Heavy Rain, because I knew, because I heard, oh, that's a PS3 exclusive that a lot of people are saying is good. I'm all like, okay, I also didn't have a PS3, so I never played it. Yeah. And then I heard you talking about Indigo Prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw your video about it, and you showed me, like, the first level where you were possessed and murder a man in a bathroom stall. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that was interesting. Yeah, and you had to, like, clean up your evidence, and then the very next level, you play as the cops. And it's like, wow. But anyway. And then the game kind of falls apart after that. Yeah. You start with, you then eventually learn about ancient Mayan, like, priests who possessed you while also fighting against, like, what was it? The, internet? the Terminator? Yeah, the, the internet. You fight the, the internet. The internet AI. <laughs> the, the internet AI Terminators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, you have to find the indigo child, the, the MacGuffin. It's, it's not a character. It's a MacGuffin. So... I guess to sum up our feelings, we don't really like David Cage. Yeah, then we, then, then we learned about what happens in Heavy Rain. Yeah, we learn about, like, like when you really delve into the content of his games and the stuff he says during interviews, he comes off as a very creepy guy. And, also, and not only does he come off as that, he also comes off as just a guy who doesn't know what storytelling is. Like, I think Beyond Two Souls is probably the most egregious example of, like, not knowing how to structure a story properly. Oh, it has to be out of order to make it artsy, right? <laughs> it has to be out of order to hide all of the glaring plot holes and lack of pacing that this game has, because I threw a bunch of scenes together. Um, we should probably save most of our talks of the other games for the end of this video, since that's yeah. the plan. Uh, so, yeah, pretty much, I think we, I think our feelings are clear on what we think. Yeah. We um... So the, the games look pretty for their times. Oh yeah, the games are all technologically impressive, with the exception of Omicron. It, that that that's terrible, but that was their first game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, so I guess like yeah, we're very interested in seeing this guy fail. <laughs> so we're gonna go through a timeline of events that more or less led up to the release that are going to lead up to the release of this game. And Detroit, as many of you may or may not know, began with a tech demo that came out before um, uh, their game, Beyond Two Souls. It came out in 2012, and it was not even considered uh, a project at the time this demo came out. No, it was just showing off how good the engine looked and what they could do with, like, facial animations and the like. Okay, so the Kara demo is, like... It's kind of weird, because I feel like the story doesn't line up with, um, uh, anything, yeah, like, like, there, I mean, I, I mean, other than, like, just androids and stuff, and I guess the main character being called Kara, it looks like a, a completely different actress, um, the story is that someone's assembling an android, and they fuck up right away by giving her emotions that early on, and then he has a change of heart for no reason, and, like, like, the plot's a mess, <laughs> the plot of the seven minute demo is kind of a mess. Now, I gotta wonder, like, how do you accidentally give an android emotions? You don't, you don't. That, like, if we're going for realistic science stuff, that's just impossible. You can't do that. Unless, like, 
because I know there's other sci-fis that have have, have uh, explained that like oh they give the androids the ability to make calculations on their own and adapt and then that's how they explain it it's because they're evolving within their own programming or like in Mass Effect with the Geth like if you have multiple Geth in the same area they'll link their neural networks to think smarter yeah and yeah, eventually yeah. that just made them self-aware yeah 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 but like. It's so weird because, like, the person designing her is, like, kind of callous at first. And then he's all like, whatever. You can, I'll just, I'll, I'll sell you with your emotions. It will be fine. Also, some of the creepy sex stuff yeah. is, like, in the forefront. Like, she lists the fact that she can have sex before the fact that she doesn't need to eat or her battery life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very odd. But I guess technologically it still holds up today. Yeah, the, the trailer does look very good for being six years old yeah and like it's a tech demo so i'm not really personally i'm not really concerned with the story of that the story can make it better certainly but i mean it looked good it had good graphics and shit good facial technology like, i guess maybe you could say it might be canon with detroit but i guess it doesn't really matter if it's like just a tech demo yeah i'm pretty sure like that tech demo like story-wise is not going to come up at all in the detroit game although i'm interested to see if she has the same like serial number as in the tech demo oh there's a serial number yeah she gave like my i am unit blah 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 and then she gets the name kara oh i just oh i bet okay actually never mind I was going to say something about the languages, but never mind. Okay. And then, so, I guess in our personal timeline, you suddenly come to me one day at lunch, and they're all like, oh, they're making, um, uh, guess what Detroit's going to be? Because the game was announced before anything conceptual was, uh, was created, I think. I remember writing an article about it in college where it was just announced. And, um, uh, and then you're all like, dude, they're using, they're just making a game based off that demo we saw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember showing you that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I, have I ever told you about the essay I wrote? No. I forgot. I was supposed to write a certain type of essay for an assignment in college. And um, uh, in the essay, I pretty much wrote that um, uh, I guess I was supposed to write an opinion piece, which I did. And I'm all like, you know, it's very interesting the stuff they say about this game in this article before they reveal anything conceptual about the game. But I personally have no faith in this game. <laughs> and my teacher read this and was all oh. like, that's a good... That's a good thing to say. <laughs> One of my proudest moments when the teacher is all like, yeah, that's an amusing thought to have. What grade did you get? Uh, I got like a B or something. Oh, okay. Was, I'm, you know, that's acceptable. Why am I even, why do I even care? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and then um, uh, the Kara, the, the, so there's a Kara demo. Yes. And then suddenly it's like, we're making a game based off that demo. Here is the Detroit slash Kara trailer. Okay, so the Kara trailer... When we saw it the first time, you know, we, I think, what I, I, our first thoughts on this trailer, I think we're more or less, they're doing a thing about androids being slaves, and it's yes. being done by David Cage, and this is not going to turn out well. Now, David Cage in the past has not been subtle about, or sensitive about minorities in his games. How subtle was this trailer? From the android parking to the android sitting in the back of a bus. No, not from sitting, that standing. Sign, standing in the back of a bus. From that one sign that says, hard work for her, free time for you. From the doll packaging, you saw like some saran wrap being thrown over yeah, the androids. Like yeah, like they're action figures. Yeah, that's fucking, like, how subtle was this trailer and why is it not subtle? <laughs> I mean, there's probably worse out there with the subtleties. Yeah. But it's... As we'll see later, like, the the um parallels to the slavery... Uh, Segregation and slavery and, like, just... Cl and just, like, the, divisive issues. Like, how, history. how out there the parallels are and then statements made later makes this quite confusing... Like, okay, so you know what? If I didn't... Oh, this is going to come up a lot. If we didn't know who David Cage is, I would say that's a trailer. I'm probably not going to buy that game, but that's a trailer. I wouldn't really think anything of it. Yes. Except for the part where Kara looks at the screen and says, My name is Kara. This is our story. Now, I think doing that 
in any medium is is bad. It's it's wrong for storytelling to just look at the camera and talk to the audience. Yeah, because like I'm going to talk about this later in a future video, but there's like it's important to establish the separation between player and uh, protagonist, like whether or not there is a uh, whether or not the the uh, player character is their own person or not. It's important you establish this very clearly. And while I'm not saying you can't do a thing where it's kind of half and half, like your input and their input, like kind of coalescing, like for characters, like they have their own personality, but you also have input in their story. Yeah, I'm not saying you can't do that, but you that that requires very careful execution. The ending of this trailer was not careful execution <laughs> because it's like, this is our story. Who is our? Are you referring to the androids? Are you referring to the player and you? Like you say, in su- like Kara says in such a stern voice that like makes me feel bad and makes me cringe a little. So I don't know. So yeah, that's more. So I guess like, I guess. So yeah, I think <laughs> those are my thoughts. So that was shown at I believe E3 2015. Uh, it was not. It was just a trailer dropped. I think I'm gonna say it was at, at a con back in in uh, September because no, like E3 always happens in June, and as you can see, the date on our list here says September 27th. Okay. Um. So this was uh yeah this was three years after the demo and like a year I think after Beyond Two Souls we have a new game. And this set us up for uh, this set us up for all the sadness and the bad feelings we would have afterwards. So next up in the timeline, we have E3 2016. Yeah. So at E3, they showed off. So um, uh, the Connor trailer. At E3, they showed this off. I remember my first thought when I saw the Connor trailer was like, okay, how much are these decisions not going to matter? Because all David Cage games have a history, with the exception of Heavy Rain. Heavy Rain's the big exception of pretty much giving you a long list of choices and then nullifying all of them with some dumb, like, retcon. Yeah. Like, like within the scenes themselves. Uh, in Indigo Prophecy, if you don't pay your bill in the diner, uh, it doesn't matter. The entirety of Indigo Prophecy is like... No matter how much you fuck up cleaning up the murder scene, and no matter how well you investigate, it still progresses at the exact same pace, no matter what. Unless you're slow and the cop comes in the bathroom. Yeah. but then, that, then you just get a game over and you can restart. Yeah. So, like... And I think we talked about this trailer a lot. Like, oh, like, this clearly only matters for the scene. It's possible that, like... Saving the girl, like the girl's not going to be a character. The dude who holds her hostage is not going to be a character either. So no matter what happens, the next scene with Connor, unless he dies, but the yep. next scene with Connor will play out in, within this game. Yes. Now, I, it is interesting that he can die because that was also in Heavy Rain. I feel like that's just the one good sign, I guess. Yeah. Amidst the large amount of red flags, including like... The bad dialogue that continues to be not subtle and, like, like the trailer as a whole, like, the fact that your character can die is really cool. Yeah. Like, in Heavy Rain, I think all four characters could die? Ethan and Shelby have to survive until the final level. Okay, but... Madison and Jaden can totally fucking die. Okay. That's how that works. All right, and even then, uh, Ethan and Shelby can die in the final level. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, hmm. So, like, I'm going to bring this up again, but if we didn't know who David Cage was, we'd be, I think we'd be somewhat interested in this trailer. Although, also, at this point, though, I feel like we are kind of, like, jaded on the idea of, like, narrative games that, like, give you choices. Because so many games turn out to not give you that choice, like yeah. Fable Three and Telltale games. Yeah, especially like the sequels to Telltale games, where they streamline your p- decisions. Yeah. I, the the most glaring example I can think of right now is Walking Dead. Um, the season new, three. Yeah, the new the frontier. F- new frontier. Yeah, yeah, because season three is a separate thing now. Yeah, 
Walking Dead New Frontier. It doesn't matter who you end up with at the end of Season 2. They still die before New Frontier in a flashback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I guess, like, if we didn't know who David Cage was, we'd probably just not pay attention to this. we just write it off as another narrative game that is not going to do is not going to do anything extraordinary, I guess. Yeah. Although I, it's interesting that they didn't change very much from that to the demo released two years later. Yeah. There's a couple things we did spot, but there's also the possibility that we just failed to trigger that when we played the demo itself, a discussion we will get to later in this video after a few other things, but yeah. Um, so at the C3, uh, David Cage was interviewed and um, uh, gave us, and in that interview, there was a giant red flag. Um, he's talking about the game with a guy who's a huge fan of his games, the guy who's interviewing him, and it's like, yeah, we're gonna... <laughs> yeah, this... I don't like the attitude of this interview that's all positive and liking games, and... <laughs> but that's just me. Yeah, you're, um, you're just a crusty old fart. Yeah, that's me. Uh, crusty is all hell. Uh, but, but anyway, in the middle of this interview, he says that there has been a ton... He says, I'm not going to quote him exactly because I don't remember exactly, but David Cage says that there has been a lot of Android fiction that has portrayed androids as the villains and done it very well. But uh, this time I'm going to make a unique story that takes place from the androids perspective. Now this quote eventually got turned into unlike Blade Runner, the humans will be the villains. And whether or not you read the abridged quote or you see the actual quote, um, uh, the thought comes to mind, because they mentioned Blade Runner in the interview before he say, says yes. that quote, but the thought comes to mind, David Cage, did you fucking watch Blade Runner? And there are two possibilities, and I don't know which one is scarier. Either he's lying about watching Blade Runner because in order to be an auteur, you have to see the most famous films about the thing you're doing, and he's just saying that because that's part of the reputation he's established. Or he saw it, and he's such an idiot that he just didn't get the fucking message of Blade Runner. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know which one is scarier. I don't know which one's more probable. Like the androids in Blade Runner, they do bad things. Yeah. But they're trying to live longer than their, what was it? Like three years or something like that. Yeah, they're, they're three year lifespan. They have a short life. Yeah. And like so much of that movie takes place from the androids perspective. So the idea that you're doing something unique by having a game takes place from an android's perspective is very much like you're uninformed or misguided. Because <laughs> that state, because the idea that that type of narrative is unique is simply not true. And yeah, we made fun of this a lot. <laughs> and we're still making fun of it to this day and we will for the rest of our lives. Yeah, like the humans are the villains this time. Yeah, humans have... Like, I think I remember seeing a comment where it's like, that's like saying, um, uh, I'm going to make a zombie fiction where humans are the real monsters. <laughs> like, no, it's been done. Like, that's most zombie fiction now. Yeah. Where humans are the villains. You know, considering Detroit is filled with, I say, just the same amount of originality, why is it... Why does it have more hype than um, uh, that zombie game, Days Gone, that's also generic and not has no new ideas? I feel, personally, it's because we've seen so much zombie fiction already. Yeah. Like, people are zombied out. Yeah. The Walking Dead is on a spiral down in ratings. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Zombie games are now, like, mocked when they are announced. Unless they're big, big titles like Resident Evil. Yeah. I should just say, I shot on Days Gone, but like Days Gone could still be a good game. I just want to make that clear. And um, also another reason, like this is still a Quantic Dream game, and you can plaster from the developers of Heavy Rain. Because Heavy Rain met with big, huge critical acclaim when it came out. Because even though that game fails in execution, it tried to do a lot of things that games have not been doing. Mainly, I say mainly through its feature where characters get killed off early in the yeah, story. A, a cinematic, um, interactive game that's story-based. Yeah, and it has like a twist that's memorable. It's not good, but it's memorable. <laughs> and like, there's just, <laughs> there's a lot going for that game. And it's sad that it didn't, if that it wasn't as good as it could have been. Yeah. Like, but, 
I'm kind of going like, off topic. I, I make fun of g- games that uh, use cutting edge graphics where you have to see every pore on Nathan Drake's face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that game did look very good when yeah. it came out. It still looks kind of good. Um. So yeah. Uh. David Cage doesn't know what he's doing. Part one, or part twenty, depending on where you are. Um. The next big thing in this timeline happens at E3 2017, where we got a new trailer with a new character. Okay, so many things about the Marcus trailer. Okay, so first off, um, a thing to know about Marcus is he has two different colored eyes. Yeah, because he's an anime protagonist. (laughs) That makes him stand out and shows he's the chosen one. Yeah, never mind that he's an android, and I thought all androids were designed in a very similar way to each other. I mean, there are so many trailers, like, previous and later on that show, like, just androids looking similar and just having similar, like, physical features and shit. And so Heterochromia just goes against all that. Also, apparently the song sang at the beginning of the trailer is a slave song, although I've yet to find anything that confirms that. But if that is true... I would believe it. They have a black android singing it while showing the other androids doing manual labor. Yeah. You know, this game feels like it's just an unbalanced mix of both segregation and slavery. And, like, it just doesn't work. Like, all forms of oppression are just thrown into this game. Apparently, based on the thing I read on TV Tropes, I didn't look into this either, but apparently there's some Nazi symbolism in there too. Where I'm, uh, I think there's some, like, I guess there's symbols on their, um, uh, their left arms. Oh, okay, the glowing blue triangles. Yeah, apparently that's, uh... Okay, yeah, like, um... Like, that, that feels like a stretch now that, I, that, that we're talking uh, about. Well, it, but. during the, um, Holocaust, um... Jews would have uh, the Star of David on, like, armbands they have, and um, other people would have others. Like, um, political dissidents would have another symbol. Uh, The most famous of those is that homosexuals would have a, I believe it's a purple triangle on their... uh, on their armbands. Okay. And after the Holocaust, that got um, turned around, and it's now become a symbol of homosexuality. Huh. Interesting. But, like, okay, so we have, like, we have segregational symbolism, we have slavery symbolism, and we have Holocaust symbolism, and we're just throwing them all in a melting pot of shit. (laughs) Just stir it up. Oh, man, we haven't talked about the rest of this trailer. (laughs) So this is the second in a series of trailers where it's like, uh, the trailer, the plot of the trailer progresses normally, and then you reach an ending, and then the game goes, things could have been different, face dilemmas, and it gives you kind of a a, a musical montage, a very well, I think, edited montage of all the different yeah, um, uh, like, choices you can make. Like rioting, putting up stupid holographic banners. Okay, let me just, like, deconstruct the logic of that. So they have holographic graffiti... And holograms, much like, like, holograms are projections. They're something that come from a light source. That's, this is a thing in all sci-fi that's established. Even in Voyager, where it's, like, super loose, like, in that hologram is just walking around wherever he wants. They always justify his appearance wherever he is. But, like, you can't just leave a hologram, you can't just make a hologram somewhere and leave and someone has to clean it up. By the way, how do you clean holographic graffiti? You just throw water at it? No, you use a holographic, like, <laughs> you, you, you use a holographic, like, squeegee. Okay, so the only way this would make sense is that you're not creating holograms, but you're creating, like, um, a distortions in reality that hide in their own separate dimension. No, <laughs> what what you're doing is you're not, ho- you're not spray painting the holograms, you're spray painting the, uh, the, the nanobots that emit the holograms. Oh my god, but that would cost a billion fucking dollars that in a sh- and these androids who, I'm assuming Marcus and North, that was the name of the lady in the trailer, I'm assuming they're living on the streets or living in a l- low-income apartment or something because they're rebels and rebels don't get good housing and <laughs> well, they, they don't-, don't have enough money to buy this technology. Well, they don't need to eat or sleep. Because they're using this holographic... Okay, yeah, sure. But they're using this holographic technology right next to using Molotovs. 
And it's like so fucking... By the way, those Molotovs looked pretty futuristic. Did they? Yeah, it wasn't just like a beer bottle with like That's what a, I thought a it was. cloth coming out. Or, well, it didn't look like that way to me. Okay. It looked like some kind of grenade. Um... Oh man, this trailer's more egregious than I remember. Also, I don't know what to think about the fact that Marcus can just touch another android and, like, give them the logic virus. Because the whole thing of android fiction is that through their processors or whatever plot point causes it, they, they're they always supposed to develop emotions as they experience things. And that's kind of, like, allegorical to, like, children, you know, learning things as they grow up. Except androids start out as, like, an adult, because that's how they're designed that well, way. Well, I guess, uh, in this case, the self-awareness is just spread around like an STD. Marcus, yeah, Marcus can, oh. Marcus can just free people by touching them. That's what we're trying to say. He touches them and says, you're free now, or something like that. Like... Or you're 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 aware now, or something like that, and then the androids suddenly have emotions. I, I'm just interested to see like what wh- how that happens in the game. Like, can is he the only one that can do that? Can other androids pass it on? Like, I imagine it's gonna be kind of like Heavy Rain, where everyone has their own gimmick, and uh, Kara's gimmick is that she's going to be a female character in the David Cage game. Uh, man, I should have ended with that. Uh, Connor's gimmick is that he can do Batman investigation, like Arkham Knight stuff. Or, um, Jaden from Heavy Rain. Yeah, more, yeah, he's more or less Jaden, that's a better comparison. And, and Marcus is gonna be, he can free people. And fight, and probably do better fighting than all the other characters. So, there are a lot of, a lot of parallels between this and Heavy Rain. You can play as multiple protagonists. Protagonists can apparently die. Yeah. And it seems that this game, like Heavy Rain, when it was released, is also devoid of supernatural elements as far as we can see. Well, well, here's the thing about Heavy Rain, though, that we also must... That's why I said when it was released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 but... Like... There was, of course, the cut footage about the psychic connection. Yeah, but... yeah, and the drowning and the stuff. But Heavy Rain, is, until Detroit comes out, is the only Quantic Dream game to ha- to be mostly that... set in reality. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, a lot of people, I don't know when the jokes started coming out, but I'm wondering when the jokes started coming out where it's like, okay, the twist is going to be... The androids are humans all along, or they have human souls inside them, and it's going to be be because of aliens or some shit. Well, I don't know when that stuff started happening, but I love it. It's probably because all the other games have supernatural elements in them. In Indigo Prophecy, it's like Mayan like uh, magic, or um, in uh, in Beyond Two Souls, it's she it's has ghosts. yeah, it's ghosts in the infra world. And also Native American uh, spirits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll Here's be- the thing. Like, supernatural elements, at, if they are in Detroit, they will only make the current product even more ludicrous because it's already plenty ludicrous by itself with all the sci-fi shit that makes no sense. I would welcome it completely because that would be <laughs> so... Such a mess, it's entertaining. I would get really hyped for that as well. I got really hyped when the twist of uh, fucking Beyond Two Souls, when that happened at the very end of the game, I got really hyped for that because of how dumb it was. Oh, man. Okay, one more thing. There's another thing about this trailer we can talk shit about. Um, yes. So they bust into the store, and then they're all like, you're free now, and then the and you have your own free will, the freedom to make your own decision, and that is responded with all the androids in unison saying something very similar and with very robotic voice acting, directly contradicting everything that Marcus just said about them having emotions. Now, what what would have made it better was if some of them, like, raised their fists or something. Yeah. Or started cheering. Like, Dif- it, like different responses. They should have been more expressive. Like... Uh, something other than them all giving, like, the same response with different wording. We'll follow you, Marcus. Why don't I just have them all go, like, yeah, and jump up in the air? That would be more human. <laughs> have a freeze frame and then go face dilemmas. <laughs> How hyped do you want your revolution to be? Um, now, if they can, if they can, like, use the 
splitting timelines of pacifism or violence and actually stick to it, I will give this game props. Like, Le- you... like legitimate props. Like, if the, the forking paths stick, like, it affects the story and sections of the game are okay, locked okay. off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I was going to ask, like, and then you just more or less answered that. But yeah. Um, yeah, that would be very cool. And that, I would give serious props for that. And there are signs of that in the trailer, because you see all the other characters watching it on TV and reacting to it. Like, you don't see them react to the violence one, which is kind of a red flag in itself, because it's like we didn't get to see the pacifist option. Well, whereas violence... Whereas in the Connor trailer, we saw more or less every single option. Well, violence could have, like, um, happened afterwards. I suppose. But, like... I don't know, but, like, I think if they really wanted to show pacifism in any form, like, the pacifism route in any form, they would have sh- had a cut of the, of the player picking the pacifist decision, which they didn't have. Possibly. And that makes me worried that, like, that decision, like, the pacifist decision might be overwritten by something. Like, maybe, the like, the slaughtering the androids will happen no matter what, and... No matter if you're peaceful or violent, it will kind of lead to that decision whether or not to kill the guy who, I guess, shot a bunch of androids. A guy we didn't see, oddly enough. Uh, I would guess he's a police officer. I'm, I guess that we're, that's what we're supposed to assume, because they were fighting cops in the trailer. Well, oh, it might have been Connor. Well, Connor was watching the news report, though. Uh, it could have happened later. Like, we don't know the, the, the series of events. that. Okay. Like, we don't know how far in the timeline some of the stuff is. Okay, you're right. Um, I was going to suggest another theory. Maybe it's, like, um, uh, Connor's partner or something like that. Maybe that's why they didn't show him. It's going to be a twist. Oh, yeah. That, or like that, that car- would make sense. His, like, they said he has a human partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be very cool if it was that, that another player, another character could affect another character's story. And uh, considering in Heavy Rain that didn't work out so well, like, like, man, I'm talking about this game like it's going to be good now. Um, (laughs) I don't think it's going to be good, but I'm just saying it would be cool if it went down that direction. It would be a very pleasant surprise indeed. It would be like the finger scene in Heavy Rain where it's like, it's an isolated thing that just works really well. (laughs) We should probably move on. Yeah. Oh, man, we talked so much shit about this trailer. Okay. So... After this, a bigger thing happened, at least in my opinion. Um, I'm going to bring up the article just so we can tell you guys about it. I'll probably put it up on the video when I edit this. After all that talk, this is the bigger thing. (laughs) More or less, because David... Because we've been talking about how David Cage has no plan, and his games and a few things that have happened before this story broke out have uh, indicated this. But with this story in particular, I am absolutely certain that David Cage has no idea what the fuck he's doing. And he is just a shit writer. Oh, we get into it now. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna... I'm just going to read the, um, uh... I'm gonna read the article starting from here to here. And All then right. we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay, so the article's title is an article on Polygon that, um, uh... It says, David Cage wants you to believe his games have no meaning. That's a red flag. <laughs> And um, uh, what the article is is essentially a collection of uh, quotes, contradictory quotes he said in various interviews of different um, uh, news sources. And, um, uh, and then the rest of the article is the, is, the, is the writer just talking about how messed up it is. So anyway, the article reads as so. Um, the problem with saying anything political in a video game is that people who disagree with that message may not buy your game. Since you want a lot of people to buy your game, it's important to avoid politics and never, ever state you're trying to say anything with your piece of art. The problem with this approach is is you tie yourself a notch trying to convince other people that you're saying nothing with your game. That's a strange position to take, and Detroit Become Human's David Cage had a particularly challenging E3 trying to convince everyone that Detroit had interesting things to say, while assuring everyone that it said nothing at all. You have to be respectful, because this is a game, Cage told Polygon. We put a lot of passion, and we're honest and sincere. But it's nothing compared to real issues and real people in the real world. We try to be aware of that, and we want to be respectful of real things. It's important to leave the tired tropes of video games behind, Cage used to argue. There should be more people trying this, he said in an interview in 2011 with Kotaku, I think. Don't write about being a rookie soldier in World War II because you don't have a clue what that's like. 
Talk about yourself, your life, your emotions, the people around you, what you like, what you hate. This is how the industry will make a huge step forwards. I'm fed up with spa space marines. Now, let's pause for a second and be all like, the idea that you can't write about something because you haven't personally experienced it is the death of writing. Because you all may as well fantasy not... fantasy and all sci-fi are thrown out the window immediately. Yeah, and like... Here's why, like, oh, but oh, but those stories are bad because it's not about personal experiences. Well, like, writers, like, m weld in their personal experiences into a lot of the fiction that they write. Like, like, I think a lot of writers will tell you that they do that. They take the parts of their personal life and make it part of the plot. Like, like drama they experience with friends and, like, stuff they like, being oppressed and stuff like that. Yeah, like, uh, The Lord of the Rings. A lot of people have the theory that its themes are based around uh, Tolkien's experiences of World War I with allegories of the war and, like, the devastation it causes. Yeah. Although I just I have to mention that Tolkien himself has said that allegory sucks. <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he's denied it, but uh, a lot of people argue that it might have unconsciously influenced his works. I guess the point of, I guess, like, the crux of the point of what I'm trying to say is that, like, like, it's not just because you haven't experienced something doesn't mean you can write about it and make it immersive. Because people have found ways to do that in clever ways all the time. Yes. Also, there's a thing called bringing in experts to do research. Yeah, like Saving Private Ryan was a movie where they brought in like uh, people from the war. I forget their names. Uh, but they brought in people from like World War II to like talk about their experiences. Like Spielberg brought people in. Also, I'm fed up with Space Marines. Now, this was in 2011. Yeah, so that's before Mass Effect 3 came out. This is, I would say, a year after Halo Reach. Yeah, and Halo Reach was still going strong. Yes. So that, that trope was very much a very prevalent thing, I say. Although I would argue that this is around the time when Space Marines were starting to die off. Yeah. Did Mass Effect 3 kill Space Marines? I think it did. <laughs> did Halo 4 kill it, Space Marines? It killed... <laughs> well, no, it didn't kill uh, Mass Effect. Andromeda did that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's like, I guess, like, well, that's like more or less talking about the series themselves. Mass Effect 3 kind of killed it. <laughs> the writer left before Matt. Okay, um, before I, um, back on topic. So let's, uh, let's continue with this article. Um, Detroit is a game. Oh, yeah, so the, po oh, another point, like, D David Cage is saying this while, like, He's writing, do you have experience being an android or a slave in, a, do, in the town of Detroit or a do, big city? Or do you what? have experiences trying to catch serial killers? Yeah. <laughs> do you have experiences being possessed by ancient Mayan magic to kill a man in a bathroom stall? Do you have experiences like, I don't know, drowning children? <laughs> Do you have experiences getting sucked into a video game and switching bodies? Oh god, that's a fucking oof. I bet if you asked David Cage anything about Omicron's story, he would have forgotten most of it. I, I bet money on that shit. <laughs> he wants to forget about it. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if he wanted to forget about it, because I think even a man as deluded as David Cage would like be all like, okay, this game is actually not that good. But I don't know. It had David Bowie in it, so maybe not. Okay, so Cage told Kotaku... Okay, so just continuing the article. The story I'm telling is really about androids, Cage co told uh, Kotaku at this year's E3. They're discovering emotions and wanting to be free. If people want to see parallels with this or that, that's fine with me. But my story is about androids who want to be free. This isn't Cage saying anything. He's just posting questions. But it was an interesting question that we wanted to ask the player in the scene. What do you think is right to do when you fight for your rights? He asked, okay, let me say that. What do you think is right to do when you fight for your rights? He asked Waypoint. And I didn't want to provide an answer. And this is something that is so important to me. I didn't want to deliver a message to mankind with this game. I just want to ask questions. He, he, he actually wanted to say something, though. According to an interview with another outlet, people will see it as, oh, this is about androids and the revolution. And honestly, I don't think this is the story I wrote, Cage told The Verge. I think it's really a game about us, humans, and what it means to be human. It's about identity. It's about civil rights. Or he's just asking questions. And this is the same interview, by the way, 
There is no big message to humanity in this game, Cage also said to The Verge. It's just interesting questions that may resonate with your own personal values and just confront you with the consequences of your actions. Okay, so first off, <laughs> this is a game about androids. It's not asking questions. Second, no, this isn't about androids. This is about us, humans, what it means to be human. Okay, first of all, I think saying what it means to be human is way too goddamn vague for anything and means nothing. But like, no, it's not about that. It's about androids and it's about them discovering emotions and being free. We're not saying anything. It's like, that's saying something. It's about sentience. It's about fighting for your rights. Like, the, like this oxymoron-laden statement followed after all these other oxymoron-laden statements. Like, interview after interview, he's just, it, he's just contradicting his previous statements. Yeah, and, like, 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 for, like there's, like, there's, like, it's pretty clear-cut. Like, there's one interview where he's all, like, it's not about anything. If you want to draw parallels, that's fine. And then in The Verge, he says, it's about identity. It's about civil rights. And that's... <laughs> whew. He's not making a statement. He's just making a statement. Like, it's so, like... It's so... Like, it's so gross because this is... This is clearly just a guy telling individual interviews what they want to hear, what he thinks they want to hear at the time. He's selling his game, and that's fine, but you can do it better than this. You can be consistent. You can have notes or something, like... like the, or you could have an idea of what your game is about. Like, this article does say that it's hard to write politics in games because you risk uh, shunning a, the one side in favor of the other, and you want many people to buy your games. Yeah. Um, so I started following Clinic Dream's Twitter after this. Because <laughs> I wanted to after, see if I After could... this interview? Yeah, after this. I just wanted to see what else I could get. And, um, uh, like, he says a statement, and if I can find it here, um, uh... But, okay, so the quote is all like, it was an interesting question that we wanted to ask the player, what do you think is right to do when you fight for your rights? And that's pretty vague, because that's all like, what do you think is appropriate for fighting for your freedom? That's, you know, a lot of a lot of things could answer that question. And then on Quantic Dream's Twitter, I think a few days after this, I saw a thing where it's like, Quantic Dream poll, what would you choose, violence or pacifism? And it's like, that's two decisions! That's not enough to pose... Like, I, I think I remember you showing this to me. Yeah, 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 I showed you it. <laughs> and, like, there's several different options just looking at history. There's violence. There's a, a pacifistic, like, objectivism. Or, I, I'm not sure I'm using the right term, but, like, uh, nonviolent uh, opposition. Yeah, like, objectivism the, is, like, you know, individuality yeah, and stuff. There's, so, yeah. like, separate, like, separation like just get out of there and start your own yeah there's like, many different options other than the very vague violence or pacifism now here's another thing and this i don't think this really has much to do with the whole him contradicting himself but like the thing is if you're it's really hard to be vague with questions in games because the the these qu questions you pose in games, whether or not you have a political thing in it or or whatever its themes are, you're kind of going to inevitably provide an answer through play, like especially in narrative driven games without much like gameplay. When you're like where the input in that game is that you pick a decision, like th those decisions pretty much represents the answers that the developers have presented you. So it's kind of difficult to just pose questions, and. <laughs> And, but, and alongside that, it's like violence or pacifism. <laughs> Those are the only answers we got. So, um, yeah, we more or less talked about this. So, E3 2017 ends, and then um, uh, the, the year is about to end, and it's been a great year for video games. We had tons of games with good narratives in them. That are clearly going to be better than this game that comes out. We had Near Automata. Yeah. We had Persona Five. Yep. We had. Uh, would you say Breath of the Wild? I would say Breath of the Wild. I think it does some very interesting things with its narrative. We had, well, not Mass Effect Andromeda. 
we we didn't have Mass Effect Andromeda. We didn't have the Telltale game. I don't know. New Frontier was last year, right? I, I think <laughs> so. Okay, so we didn't have Walking Dead New Frontier. Anyway, so it's towards the end of the year, and um, uh, another trailer drops at a Paris game show. Um, and it is a trailer featuring a character we've already seen before. It features Kara and, I guess, the origin of her story. The trailer is about Kara, who has been bought by this... Um, by a, a dad. A single father yeah. who, who has a uh, daughter... And apparently, two weeks earlier, he had broken her in a rage and got her repaired and reset. Yeah. I don't now, know how he had the money for that. But. Now, <laughs> yes, people have pointed out, looking at the neighborhood he lives in, that state of his house, and, like, they even said that he was recently unemployed. How could he afford one of these very expensive-looking androids along with getting one of them repaired. Maybe the androids cost 25 cents. You know, you just put a quarter in a soda machine, and there you go. You get a free human. Like, that's the only explanation that makes sense, or at least something along those lines. But I guess this is another situation where I want to say, what if we didn't know about David Cage? I would say that's actually the best trailer so far. Although some of the acting is... Very over the top. Yeah, although that goes for all the trailers. <laughs> yeah, but this one was the most noticeable. Like, when he, like, flips the table and starts yelling at her. Like, this is why your mother left us! Yeah, like, he's just a poorly written, like, one-dimensional villain. And his dialogue and the poor delivery of it reflects that super good. Um, so, like, yeah, again, this is a trailer where it's like things could have been different. Like, the first part of the trailer ends with the girl dying because he didn't do anything. And the rest of the trailer shows you all the choices you can make. This is a game where choices matter. Um, I don't know. With the Connor trailer, I feel like what will happen is that the choices are isolated as well. And then it won't matter. And the only things that will change. Like, I doubt the child character has any good writing behind her. And thus, her being alive or dead really won't affect the rest of the story. And thus, like, she's just going to be a person that stands next to Kara during essential dialogue scenes and uh, later parts of the game. Yeah. What I found interesting was, if you go back to the uh, Marcus trailer, his name is Marcus, right? Yes, his name is Marcus. The, the Marcus trailer. It does show Kara in that house before this demp. Before this uh, trailer came out. I thought it was a different house. Because, like, there was, like, a shadow of a person behind there in the Marcus trailer. And he didn't have, like, the, I guess, the silhouette of the other guy. Uh, oh, it might be. Like, I'm guessing, like, I, I always assume, I assumed when we watched it um, uh, that she was just in a different... She was in hiding with a friend or something like that. Uh, possibly. Maybe Marcus inspired her to take action. Maybe. <laughs> So, the major part of this trailer is that it shows that the father is abusive towards the daughter. Yeah. Eventually, like, if you make the wrong choices, resulting in the daughter dying. Yeah, and, like, you have options. You can lock the door, you can escape with Alice, you can fight off her dad. That will probably end up in killing him, or Kara failing and the daughter dying anyway. You know, it presents a lot of stuff. And I'm, uh... This is also interesting. This is also interesting because, like, with Kara's first trailer, like, I, I get that went with the announcement of this game. Um, uh, like, now we know her origins. <laughs> now, I got the impression that she just escaped on her own and became self-aware on yeah. her own. But this seems different. I, I'm start. I'm trying. I'm curious to see what the in between between this and her on the street is yeah but then again we were also curious about what ellen page like S the in between but and then of, we didn't know yeah and then it didn't tell us when we should have known because pacing is awful in that game um what else what else uh so it looks like a, so in some weird instance of asset reuse the house looks the exact same as ethan mars's house and I don't know whether or not the game runs on the same engine or not, but, like, either they just flat out, straight up just use that house again for some reason. Because that's David Cage's model of a poor American's house. 
Or they just redesigned it that way because that's his template for, like, uh, just American House. And I get that feeling with uh, a lot of the uh, apartments in, uh, his ver in various games. I feel like a lot of them, like, if you laid out the architecture for all those in front of each other, they actually are designed the exact same. I don't know that for sure, though. That's just a theory I have. It's very... He has this strange thing in his games where everyone has large apartments. Not just large apartments, just large spaces of living that are unreasonable no matter what. Yeah. Like, even the hobos in Beyond Two Souls, they have just this this big closed-off area that's like... I think they're... Un I think they live in an underpass. Like, under a highway? Yeah. That's the impression I got. I guess so. But, yeah. That's how it would make sense, I guess. I don't know. It's weird, and but I guess I guess like if you can ignore the the bad dialogue and um, uh, the bad acting, and the fact that David Cage is responsible for it, it's not a bad trailer. <laughs> Question mark. Like I don't know. How do you feel about this trailer overall, Brett? Mm. It wasn't very subtle at all. Okay. So like, that's what I take away from it. Like, your thumb is kind of down on this one? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I felt that the Connor trailer was probably the best. Yeah. Um. So, this um, resulted in some uh, child protection groups. Um, uh, due to its um, uh, portrayal of abuse, um, uh, they, they um, uh, decried this game as a promoting... <laughs> And, like, giving people an outlet for getting off on abuse, which... I, I thought it was more that it just trivializes it for shock value. There was a... I, don't know, I saw a Twitter post by, like, a group called the CSA. I'm guessing that's, like, child support activist group or something. I'm, like, I'm guessing that's what that stands for. You know, I have an article. I'll just bring it up quick. Yeah, okay, so... Back on topic, like, the voice... Uh, the child sexual abuse organization... Um, uh, they were all like, this game is going to normalize child sexual abuse and domestic violence... And um uh and they were not the only only organization to um uh hey <laughs> they were not the only organization to um uh hate the scene to like criticize it and all that. Yes. I'm gonna I'm not gonna say hate, the, just plow, were, just criticize it. There were numerous people like decrying it and asking why is it here? Yeah. And um uh like so Eurogamer, and in response to this trailer, Eurogamer um, uh, had an interview with David Cage, and they uh, asked him um, uh, what was the purpose of that scene, why is it in the game, and what topics do you want to explore with a scene like this? And, you know, they asked him pretty reasonable questions, but um, uh, he, I don't think he really answered a single one of these questions. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read through, you want to read through the entire interview? No, just some of the better ones. <clears throat> okay. But pretty much, like, like I'll link the article in the description of this video, but he more or less, like, gave a bunch of non-answers, and he didn't really answer any question directly. Like, he didn't say he didn't want to answer certain questions. He didn't, like, try to really... Okay, yeah, so one of the questions asked in this interview, or do you want to do this one, Brett? Uh, it was, first he asked him if he had seen any of the re responses to the trailer, which had popped the day before. Yes. His reply was, no, he had not. And... Uh, he was told that there were some mixed responses, some saying it was emotionally moving, others saying it was going for pure shock value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, when um, showing a d abusive home. And his response was, basically, I'm just uh, telling my story. Yeah. And the interviewer said, domestic abuse and child abuse is quite extreme as things go. Now, David Cage's response is, let me ask you this question. Would you ask this question to a film director or to a writer? Would you? Yes. You would ask the same question. Yes, I asked the same question. Why is it interesting to you? Why did you want to explore domestic abuse and child abuse? Being super... <laughs> okay, I want to read the follow-up to um, uh, this one right here because of this response. <laughs> what? Why did I want to do this? For me, it's a very strong and moving scene, and I was interested to put the player in the position of this woman. I chose her point of view. If I'd have chosen the point of view of the man, it could have been a totally different story and with totally different emotions. But in this case, I chose her point of view. There's a context in the story. There's a reason for that. Where she comes from and where she's going to go. 
What's important to me, and what's important in Detroit, is to say that a game is as legitimate as a film or a book or a play to explore any topic such as domestic abuse. And yet, like, a few seconds earlier he asked, would you ever ask a film director this and stuff, and like... Uh, and then, yeah, his response is, I'm not, and then the interview's response is, that I'm not disputing that at all. The concern I have is that it's using something like domestic abuse and child abuse, which is a very real issue for, unfortunately, far too many people, and using it as a window dressing rather than exploring the ramifications of those issues. <laughs> um, okay, let me, and then, like, the rest of the, like, he just doesn't answer any questions in this interview. He doesn't answer them directly enough. Like and he when, more or less fails to kind of justify his usage of the scene. Like when asked why he chose to use it, he his response is, no one chooses to use these things. Yes, they do. <laughs> what the fuck is that response? And like we had a huge discussion about that where it's like, if we were competent writers, why would we use a scene like this? And uh, we gave answers like, um, uh, oh, we need to establish like, the place where Kara came from so that it establishes her character and um, uh, what actions she would take in later parts of the story. Or maybe we're like... It could parallel like future decisions she makes. Like, I've seen this before. I'm not going to make the same mistake again in not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it could be like... Like, Kara... Like, maybe it's setting up Kara as a, as a relatable person in this real-life situation, and that's how the player projects themselves onto her. Because, like, you know what? Like, you could, like, say that, oh, she's a bystander in the situation, and you have to make the decision to help or let it happen at the risk of your own life. And that could be somewhat allegorical to, like, a real-life situation. Like, that's, like, I guess if I was writing a scene like that, that's how I, 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 that's how I would explain it. But, like, David Cage just doesn't, like, he just more or less, like, feels like he's being attacked, and... He acts like he's being attacked in what he's allowed to do as a writer. And that's not what the interviewer is doing at all. He's just asking him, like, why do you feel like this scene is necessary? Yeah. And it comes and like, if the contradictory interviews didn't make you think that this guy has no idea what he's doing, then this will, this will also make you think he has no idea what he's doing for the first time or the second time. Like, however, later on, things get worse. We want, we're transitioning to our next, um, uh, the next part of this timeline. Yes. Er All right. So early this year, allegations came out about Quantic Dream's working conditions. Yep. And like, this has arguably nothing to do with the development of the game, but it does have everything to do with Quantic Dream's and Debbie Cage's reputation as developers. <laughs> so pretty much three French outlets, I'm a Le Monde, I'm a, uh, Okay, Canard is one media... Okay, so yeah, Le Monde, Canard, and Media Part, three French news outlets collab uh, collaborated, and they all post articles at the same time, pretty much talking about uh, toxic studio work culture at Quantic Dream, and their sources as based on the articles themselves. Not all of them have been translated. I think Canard's the only one that's been translated. Okay. But like, uh, but yeah, they um, uh, from various former and current members of, of uh, Quantic Dream staff have talked about like the uh, toxic studio work culture at the workplace. And um, uh, apparently there's a lot of like, um, uh, you know, higher up people pushing kisses on the people who don't want it. Um, uh, there's a lot of racism. Like uh, they were uh, robbed at one point and um, uh, David, K and when they uh, were watching footage of the robbery happening, David Cage, I guess um, uh, looked over at a, he just looked at a member of his staff who was of a different race and said, is that guy one of your cousins? The guy who's robbing us? Um, oh. there's also apparently, um, there's a, a bunch of photoshopped pictures of various Quantic Dream staff members in various, like, sexual and, like, unflattering positions. And if you look at the translated Canard article, which I will also link, there are some, there are some samples of these photos. And they're very explicit. And not only, like, uh, like, unflattering positions, but also, like, with Nazi imagery for some reason. Oh, and no. And apparently, like, these were sent to just everyone at the office. And uh, apparently, like, David Cage himself makes a lot of inappropriate comments about female co-workers and actresses who he works with. Oh, yeah, to to Nissi in origin, yeah. So, yeah, after watching uh, a burger lady called on a CCTV, Cage allegedly asked an employee of Tunisian origin, is that a I cousin think of I yours? think it's pronounced Tunisian. Tunisian? Okay. Yeah. Sorry if I heard pronouncing that wrong before. Um, but, yeah, like... 
just a shitload of stuff came out about allegations and like now, our reaction to this our our reaction to this was pretty much um uh we aren't really that surprised. No, in many of the previous games, female characters have not been treated as equally as everyone else. Yeah, like they've always been like they've always been really poorly written. They've always been featured in many like sexual assault scenes and sex scenes, which is you can't do those things together as closely as they're like fuck. And like in Indigo Prophecy, the main female character like there's a lot of evidence that the writer of these games is <laughs> is not a is kind of a creep. Like the main female character of Indigo Prophecy like suddenly falls in love with the main male character and they just have sex. Yeah, and the big and there's also the one where it's like Mass and Page was the only actress to have like two actors. Um, uh, the voice actress would do her face, and then they hired an English model to portray her physical self. And from what I found, like, there's no reason for that, unless you want to like, like the implications of that, and the fact that she's like that. Masson's character is featured in the most like rapey and pornographic scenarios in that game. Like, there are is the, is the creepiest single single thing that I think has ever come out of a Quantic Dream game. Like, if you count the DLC, there are three separate cases of clear sexual assault. Yeah, against her. And then... It's so fucked up that I'm all like, I feel like you're forgetting a few. <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there's the doctor who yeah. tries to... Who feels her up and tries to kill her. Yeah, there's um, uh, Paco at the strip club. Who forces her to strip at gunpoint. Yep. And then in the DLC, there's a taxidermist who tries to kill her and then turn her into a taxidermy, yeah. like, dummy. There's also just characters perving on her in general. Like, there's quite a bit of that. Yeah. And... So David Cage has um uh, so the article that th this came out on was um uh, Quantic Dream is shocked by these allegations. They denied everything, and um uh, and David Cage's response to this was that the allegations were ridiculous, absurd, and grotesque. You want to talk about homophobia? He said, "I work with Ellen Page, who fights for LGBT rights. You want to talk about racism? I work with Jesse Williams, who fights for civil rights in the USA." <clears throat> Excuse me. Who fights for civil rights in the USA? Judge me by my work. <laughs> now, I would like to point out that the one person of color in Heavy Rain uh, was voiced by a it, white guy, which is not bad by itself. Is uh, his name is was it Mad Jack? Mad Jack, and he's introduced working in a junkyard. And if you uh, you have two different ways to meet him. One of which is you walk up to him and he's all like, what you want, cracker? Like. And then he's, he tries to kill you because he's a criminal. I want to extend on the previous point. Like, so, so Mad Jack is voiced by a white guy, which again, I don't have no problem with. Like I, I've, I'm a fan of a lot of characters who are like white people voiced by black people. Like it gets, it happens a lot in the industry and it's fine. As long as it's not stereotypical, it's usually fine. Um, but like, as you said, he says, what's up, cracker? And that's like, oh, and also um, he's like, Mad Jack is like, I think one of the few people in that game who's not based off their actor. So that means someone was flat out told to design a threatening looking black tie with giant, with giant lips and like, and like, it's not, this is going to sound absurd, but it's not clear. Like there's not enough evidence to determine whether or not there are racial intentions behind that scene. Because no one has flat out said anything, but, like, if you just, like, you should just look it up. Heavy Rain, Mad Jack, you'll pro pro probably find clips, and, you know, you can just judge that whole sequence for yourself. But, like, it, it just looks so, it just makes you uncomfortable, because you don't know if it's racist or not, and it's leaning heavily towards one of them. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> not, it's not good. Yeah. Also, uh, get, going back to the homophobia. Yeah, we should, like, we went really off topic there. <laughs> I went off topic. Anyway. Uh, I work with Ellen Page. That was for one game. Yeah. Like, he says, I work with her. Like, he's currently working with her, which is like, that's not true. You... That should be past tense, because she's not working with you anymore. That was only for Beyond Two Souls. Yeah, and here's the two points that contradict that. 
Ellen Page is going to sue Quantic Dream for having a 3D nude model of her inside the game. That which was not part of her contract. Yeah. Secondly, Ellen Page came out as a lesbian like a, almost a year, I think, after this game's release. So David Cage, you had no idea of what or, that you were working with someone who fights for LGBT rights. <laughs> And, like, Jesse Williams, like, I don't know about that. Like, Jesse Williams is the guy who plays Marcus. Okay. And this is the first game he's worked on. Although it's kind of weird, like, that he's not saying working. Like, I'm currently working with Jesse Williams. He says, I work with Jesse Williams. Like, that's just... It seems like the same thing as Ellen Page. Yeah. Like, it's like it's almost like he'll say it right after... I, you know what? I, never mind. And then there's that last bit, Judge Me By My Work, which is like, we've kind of been doing that, and what your work says about you is that you're not that good of a writer. You're, you're um, uh, occasionally can produce a really good scene because you at least understand what the movie looks like sometimes. And also you're a huge creepazoid because of the way you portray women in your games. And it's... <sighs> like... <laughs> like the faith meter, the faith in this... <laughs> If you didn't have faith in this guy before, I I doubt I I would um uh it doesn't I don't look, know. it doesn't look good. This is it look it just looks really bad. That's the whole thing. Yeah. That's this whole video. This game looks really bad and there and this writer looks really bad. After this story, I think uh they were the demo was about to release for uh, Detroit Become Human, so we would get a chance to play it for ourselves and uh, judge it based on our actual play of it. Yep. Now a the day de before the demo came out, Kotaku released an article where um, uh, the story goes that a guy was going to meet with a reporter who worked with one of, who worked with uh, Lamond, one of the people who reported on the allegations, and um, uh, he was unable to meet with them because they're dealing with a lawsuit. And then he went and asked some Sony PR representatives what was going on. And um, uh, they said there's nothing going on. But apparently at the last second, David Cage jumped in the middle of this dog pile and said, We're suing the journalists with a big smile and look of confidence on his face. And then everyone pulled him back into the crowd and told him to shut up. That's not exactly what happened. But what happened is that they asked, yeah, he asked a Sony guy what was going on, and then David Cage said, we're suing the journalist. Now, when allegations are made against you, one thing you probably don't want to do is immediately sue them. Because that just, like, con that's almost like confirming your guilt. <laughs> like... Now, I have heard that French uh, libel and slander laws are notoriously hard to uh, overturn because you have to prove, number one, that the allegations are false, and number two, that knowing that they are false, that the, that the media outlet knowingly put those out. Yeah, you have to... You have to, like, your, it pretty much is like your objective was to defame someone. Yes. That has, that has to be proven. So if you can put any doubt in the jury's mind that they accidentally or unknowingly put out those allegations, believing they were, they were true, you lose the lawsuit. Yeah, so like, oh god, like, the, the highlight is the idea that, like, they try to keep this quiet, which... In all fair, which I guess in that particular stage of events, that was the smartest thing to do. But David Cage, for some reason, decided to tell this guy from Gotaku that they're suing them. And like, and again, a day before the friggin' demo releases and a month before the friggin' game releases. And like, it's like their reputation already taken a hit. And so, and this just makes it worse. Yes. Now, I guess something we've yet to mention is that this may not have anything to do with the quality of the game itself. Because it more or less just kind of confirms what we thought about him based on his work. But this is all leading up to the average person's perception of this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
A day later, the demo played out, and we played it after work. And you know what? I gotta say, I think they could have posted, like, two other demos, right? One, one for each character? Yeah. They could have posted any of those three. But I think they went with Connors, because I think that was probably the best story told out of the bunch. It now, had... now, the story in this tra- in this demo is the same as Connor's trailer, yeah. where he uh, is the hostage negotiator. Yeah, you get to now. Yeah, now you get to see how that plays out. And you know what? Like, I feel like by itself, the demo definitely has flaws, including bad dialogue and stuff. But it wasn't that bad. It definitely showcased different ways you can go about decisions. And I like how they were like. I like how um, uh, not all of the endings were determined by just simply choosing dialogue. It was also determined by, like, busy work you did. It was also determined by how close you got to the guy holding the girl hostage. Did, did you investigate the family? Yeah. Um, there was a couple things we didn't like. Like, I didn't like how slow he moved, the fact that you're not allowed to run. Like, I hate when games force you to walk. You automatically lose a shitload of points if you force me to walk in a scene. Also, the head of the police that are... Um that are uh, basically training their guns on the rogue android is unnecessarily, like, dismissive of Connor. Yeah. Like, you think that, um, uh, like, Connor... Like, I'm guessing the context is that Connor is coming in there as a hostage negotiator. That's his job. And I think part of that job is knowing about the person you're negotiating yes. with. He comes in and asks very reasonable questions. Yep. What is the person's name... It, are there any hostages? What history of the hostage should I or of the um hostage taker should I know about? Yeah, yeah. And then he gets blown off by the captain. He just goes, "Ah, fucking androids! I only care about the life of this girl." And it's like, huh. Well, you're not helping the girl by just not answering my questions. Yeah, and uh. But I guess other than that, like, I think that was just the worst part of the demo, just that conversation with the police chief. But everything else was more or less, I mean, other than being bogged down by, like, bad controls and um, uh, uh, bad dialogue, I think it was actually a pretty decent demo. It was interesting to look at, and it's kind of cool that you can just go back and play out the other scenarios just to see. Yeah. I mean, like, as far as demos go, it's pretty, like, like the standard of demos go, it's pretty fucking good. It's interesting to see the timeline of, like, all the choices you can have and how they branch off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, I do feel that the trailers are, um, I would say kind of weaker for showing the timeline in them. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, I feel like that's just a knee-jerk reaction to, like, because one thing Quantic Dream is criticized for, as much as, like, Telltale Games and other story-based games are criticized for, is the fact that your choices don't actually matter in most cases. And I think Quantic Dream, like, their marketing team just, or David Cage, just feels the need. Like, we have to make sure people know that there are branching paths. And we just got to show the fucking branching paths in order to make people say that. Like, put them in a position where they can't deny it. I guess. Although I feel like if someone, like, looked at one of the trailers closely, they could see, like, what decisions are the best. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that it was kind of weird that they hid the pacifist, the pacifist option. And it's like, what if that results in just, like, the same decision at the end of the trailer? But yeah, I guess, like, I mean, I didn't really have any strong negative feelings about the demo other than my the feelings I already had about the game in general. Yeah. So, you know what, let's, uh... So, lead, uh, leading up to the game, which is coming out within the next few days, the last few trailers have been uploaded. They're short, um, what'd you say, like... Less than five minute uh, videos. Yeah, yeah, they're about five. Like, there's one that's about five minutes long, and there's one that's about a minute long. All right. Um. Uh. One thing I want to mention is that there haven't been any further developments since um uh, the story came out back in April about um uh, Quantic Dream suing the news outlets. Also, they apparently um uh, they aren't going. They're going after two out of three of them. Apparently, not just like they're only going after Le Monde and uh, Mediaport, and okay. not uh, Candid. Anyway, so um uh yeah, you met yeah, the trailers that came out. Um these trailers These trailers um uh one is better than the other because it's shorter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think 
they showcase a lot of, like, there are so many red flags about this fucking game in these trailers. Which one should we go with first? Let's first talk about the Kamski trailer. Oh boy. Yep. So. Where do you want to start on the Kamski trailer? Okay, so this trailer, that is the most red flag, like, in-universe fit interview you could ever get ever give the like CEO not even just for the company. story but just in the universe yes like we need we need sarah connor right now to invade that guy's house <laughs> and shoot him in the face because that's how you get skynet yeah like uh like every question he answered he pauses dramatically beforehand like the, the trailer makes him look like such a villain like after he walks off screen, focusing on the cyber life uh, Im- uh, symbol behind him, or like pausing after he walks off screen the second time to the android being built, or or just when he's asked, uh, aren't you afraid of machines uprising? No. Trust me. Yeah, and then when it says trust me, the camera zooms in right before he says trust me, because I guess the interviewer like planned that. Like... The entire thing plays out like a very pretentious documentary, even though it's explicitly supposed to be an interview, I think. And, uh, like, let me just get some stuff. Like, the cinematography just makes no sense. Like, the guy acts like he's responding to an interviewer lady, but she's nowhere in sight, and there's no microphones in sight. And the camera keeps teleporting because the scene has to have interesting cinematography, but interviews don't have cin- interesting cinematography. No, what you do is you have a microphone in front of a guy's face. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to be picking up a bunch of machinery noises as androids are being assembled, because that's how sound works. Yeah. Um. Okay, there was a one bit of contradictory statements. It was like, one was like, there's a, they cannot say no, but they're more intelligent than humans ever will be, or something like they're, that. They're more capable than us. Yeah. And it's like... Oh. Speaking of more capable, can we talk about the 28% unemployment rate? Yeah, that's the end of the world! That is that is literally Great Depression levels. That Yeah, like... That's when people want to stop, because like... Uh, like, <laughs> like Just, it, it makes sense. It makes sense for these androids to do hard labor, like dangerous stuff, like mining, construction work. But then he says they are teachers and doctors. Which, okay, doctors on the level of, like, surgeon, that makes sense. They have steadier hands and, it, and an on-the-fly encyclopedic knowledge of all medical stuff. I yeah. can understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But teachers? That's not a good idea. Teachers have to, like, punish and discipline students according to their own judgment and stuff like that. They need to be able to answer difficult questions on the fly yeah. if, it's, if a student doesn't understand something. And he also mentions, like, oh, they might be our soldier, which is, like, fair enough. They did that in Blade Runner. But they also might be our politicians. And leaders? We don't even like our current politicians and leaders. Yeah, the qu- and the quality of a politician is dependent on a person's character, on their, like, emotional maturity and stuff like that, which androids are not supposed to have, according to this fucking video. They can't say no. Yeah, and... This is such a weird trailer to drop after every other trailer is all like, no, they're just like us. People in the comments and other stuff have said that they they think he's actually an android in disguise, and I would not doubt that. He acts like a robot. Pause, chuckle a little, give him inspirational response. Also, the worst of all, he looks like a hipster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got really upset when you were about to, like, shit on his ponytail when I have a ponytail. But it's like, yeah, he has, like, the glasses with, like, the large frame. The, he has the a ponytail, beard. The beard. He has a sweater. Yeah. He's a hipster. And it's weird because I think he's supposed to be a CEO. And also, I don't know if that also really you can fits. tell he has two necklaces on. You can't see what they are, but he has two necklaces on under his shirt. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. Um... What's the best way to sum up this trailer? 
Everything is wrong. About as subtle as a mallet to the face. Yeah. About as subtle as a fucking... I don't know. As a fucking firecracker. Like, that is how you get Skynet. Yeah. And, like... Like, I just don't understand the reason for... Like, other like other than... I don't understand the reason for this trailer coming out. Like, I don't know if there's any other reason than last-minute hype. Probably to expand the lore, but you could have just opened up with that as, like, the opening cutscene. <sighs> like... Like, why are they... <laughs> Is this even going to be in the game? Because part of me doubts it's even going to be in the game. Like, it might be an Easter egg if you, like, look at a TV, but I doubt it will be, like, a cutscene that you're focusing on. I would honestly say it would. this would probably be a good opening cutscene for the game to introduce, like, the world it, it the Detroit is in. Yeah. Like, androids are everywhere now. Like, like a stat, I guess, like, I guess to establish the mentality... Behind what people feel about androids, because he uses the word objects, which is not subtle, but it conveys a thing. <laughs> like, uh, it, oh, like, like, it's kind of weird because, like, they kind of gone back and forth into referring to them as their genders and referring to them as objects and giving them names. Like, like Connor has a name despite being uh, not a deviant. Well, like it they establish could be in a easier to identify. Other than just a serial number. Yeah, I know, but still, from a narrative, from, like, I guess a lore standpoint, it doesn't make sense, because, like, like, a lot of androids are introduced with serial numbers, and that's what you're supposed to refer to them as, but, like, some are not, initially. And they have scenes where, and they have, and they imply that names are given by their owners, but... Oh, but how did Connor get his name? Uh, probably some guys at the police station be all like, Oh, hey, Connor. Oh, actually, my serial number is... No, you're Connor. We no, don't, you're Connor. We, we don't have time to memorize that. You be quiet. Your name's Connor now. Good boy. That's your slave name. Yeah. I guess, like, we kind of stopped talking about the trailer and went into more plot contrivances. Um, so another trailer came out today, and there also might be an additional one if what we saw was correct. So let's look at the... Let's uh, talk about the, uh, I guess, the Chloe trailer. This trailer is an interview with Chloe, the first android to pass the Turing test. Also, I think the first personal assistant android? I think she mentioned that? Uh, no, it's just her role, but she's the first machine to pass the Turing test. Yeah. Now, I have seen people point out the Turing test is not supposed to be used that way. It is supposed to open up philosophical questions about a machine's self-awareness. It is not a test to see, like, does this pass or not? Yeah, and, like, that's what all of Ex Machina is about. But, like, so what does a Turing test, I guess, test? Like, is it supposed to, like, test whether or not a something, a machine or something you're interacting with can be interpreted um, or the mistaken usual, for a human? The usual way it's presented is you are, um... You are talking to a, um, what you think is supposed to be a human, and it's a, actually a machine that's very human-like. And through conversation, there you're supposed to see if people realize if what they're talking to is a machine. Now, usually, and from what I've seen, uh, from Wikipedia, you're not supposed to physically see the machine, because then you immediately know it's a machine. Yes. Uh, it's explicitly say, stated in Ex Machina that him seeing the android face-to-face -face is not a usual part of the Turing test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, again, I ask, what's the point of this trailer? The point of the trailer was the last line. I what don't... makes you, what makes us different from you? Ugh. And her line is, well... I suppose you have something I don't. A soul. Yeah. And it's... Hey, Lucas. Does this unit have a soul? Yeah, sure. Uh, like, what's the point? Like, what is... Is is there actually a bunch of... Like, are there a bunch of cancelled pre-orders we didn't know about? Is this just a last... Like, are they just ripping cutscenes from the game and just throwing them up on YouTube? Because there's actually... This game might actually fucking bomb. 
I don't know. Like, I guess some of the controversy would pull would push some people away, but yeah. I don't see a lot of people keeping up with the news. Like, most of the mainstream people, like who don't follow video game news, wouldn't know about a lot of the controversies and would just think, "Oh, this is a cool game about androids." I liked Heavy Rain. I guess I'll play this. Yeah. Okay, here's another... Th- okay, I think what you're, what you're saying is super true. But I also want to add that when I was looking up articles and rereading all this stuff, I found that pretty much every single major news outlet reported on the sexual allegations and the fact that Quantic Dream is suing two out of three of the media outlets. Now, I think a lot of gamers, once they really get into it, they actually do start following the news. And I think that there's a good chance that most people who are, I guess, really heavily into gaming and narrative games in general, probably caught glimpses of that shit. And that might have changed their decision to pre-order or buy a game and, or buy this game. But yeah, I don't know that for sure. I suppose we'll find out when the game comes out and does either good or poorly. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it could be... There's four options. Four options. <laughs> either it's a success financially but a failure critically. It's a failure financially, but a success critically. Yes. Or it's a success in both, or a failure in both. Okay, well, we've talked a lot about these individual aspects leading up to the release, because right now the, the game's going to release in, like, less than two days as of this recording. Um, I guess, how do we think this game is going to turn out? I think this game is going to be a mess, like, thematically. Yes, for sure. Because they're mixing up all these different things that just don't mix together well. Like, after after watching blo- both Blade Runner films and playing Near Automata, I feel like I've seen these themes done much better. Yeah. And this game in general just looks so unoriginal with its concepts. Because they, they're so heavy, heavy-handedly heavy pushing the whole, like, androids have souls thing. But not, like, what it means to, like... But they're not going any deeper than that. Like, they just have, like, you know, certain beats, like, you know, a revolution. And androids are training their master because, masters because these are things that happen in these types of stories. They don't seem to be really doing anything with it. And... Like, I think, I guess, I think that this game is probably going to be, like, it might, I think it's going to be better than Beyond Two Souls. It's going to be, it might be better than Heavy Rain. That's a big maybe. And it might actually be the best David Cage game to come out. But it will still be bad, because that's a low bar. Because, like, I don't know, because there's stuff going on in that demo, and, like, if the branching paths have any effect on any later parts of the story, that will be more than the nothing that previous games have got, have uh, given us. Yeah, like, the other games, like, you are on rails, like, unless your character dies off in heavy rain, the story will still progress. Like, Ellen Page will still go to the Navajo family and fight the Navajo wind spirits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she will still go to the underwater Chinese ghost base. I gotta say, those sentences you said are really fucking weird for someone who doesn't know anything about Beyond Two Souls. <laughs> but those things happen for real. Lucas Kane will still fight bugs in his office. Yeah. He will still fight angels after fighting... Oh, I forgot! <laughs> after fighting the Mayan priests. I played that game three times and I forgot about the fucking angels because I have no fucking point. And he will still get into a Matrix Kung Fu fist fight with the cops. Ugh. But if this game can actually legitimately branch, that's an improvement. Clear cut. But it still won't be a good game. I don't think this will be a good game. Yeah. 